The BeastNet Canadian Edition podcast is proudly brought to you by Grit Farm Fitness. Here we discuss all things obstacle course racing related as well as endurance, conditioning, running, rucking, and much more. Welcome to the BeastNet Canadian Edition. A. Eh? Welcome to BeastNet Podcast. Um, this is actually the first BeastNet East edition of the Canadian International Podcast. It's a, it's a mouthful, but the point is we're starting in the East and with our first East podcast, we're going to go to a guy from the West because that only makes sense. So today I have with me Jack Bauer. Uh, Jack, how's it going, buddy? Not too bad. And actually, uh, I, I'm going to correct you on that. I might be living in Colorado, but I grew up in New Hampshire, so I'm oh, on the East Coast. You put you on the West. The what? You're still there. It's all. It's like possession yeah, yeah. is nine tenths of the law. Well, so the West possesses see, you. You want to see even crazier? Where I live in Colorado is actually farther east than some parts of Texas. So it, yeah, it's a little. It's a little uh, deceiving. The whole geography thing. The maps. important thing though is like you're on a Canadian podcast now, and we really have no idea what that, happens down there anyway. So I'm just going to bluff yeah, it like yeah, it yeah. really matters. So Texas is officially west anyway. So that that's gotcha, gonna, gotcha. West anything, any yeah, anything west of like Nashville is is west, isn't it? Basically, yeah, a couple thousand miles. Yeah, yeah it's all, all right. <laughs> so the point is, and and for some of you that don't know, it's uh, you, you guys might not know who Jack Bauer is, and I'm going to lay it out for you here um, as to what makes Jack so special. And then previously I've publicly gone on record and I've said that I think Jack is one of the five most important people in OCR. And I'll get into why I believe that. And I, I can just bring it up. So things that make Jack special, he's a Spartan pro team member. All right. That that's, that's, you know, I mean, who isn't, there's like 9,000. There, there are about 300 of them. So. Okay. It's 300, 300. Anyway. Yeah. In Canadian terms, it's 9,000. It's like the money currency transfer. It's the same deal. It's, we're converting kilometers right. and stuff. Yeah. Exactly. He's a, one of the competitors of TMX, and I'm not sure you can correct me on the wrong. Did you make the finals for TMX? I was uh, one slot off. Yeah, oh. I, I was that. That yeah, my, my hands didn't heal for like a month because it, <laughs> it, it was a pretty brutal course out, outside in Virginia. It was like 100 degrees and missed it by seven seconds, but it's all good. That's all right. That's all right. That's that's, that's a bit of a sore one. Sorry to bring that up. I apologize. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, to me, some of the more important things actually. Uh, you're also one of the few guys who has actually done a proper deca fit workout. Oh yeah. And I'm, I was so bummed once. I mean, everyone's bummed about 2020, but I was sort of one of the testers with Ryan Kent and uh, Killian did a, a couple places because Denver, Colorado was going to be the first ever venue. Um, mm -hmm. And so basically they had everything set up and we were kind of in there just to make sure everything was as hard as it could be. And oh my God, that thing's going to soul crush some people. Like a lot of people are under the impression that 30 minutes is, you know, it's not hard. It's not an ultra beast. If you turn yourself inside out for 30 minutes, that's going to hurt way more than the, the longest race you can do. So and, yeah, and be ready people. <laughs> anyone who thinks 30 minutes is not enough of something is not doing their 30 minutes properly. I'm just saying. Oh, oh, no just doubt. <laughs> um, so, and, but to me, the two most important highlights are uh, second place in the running public beer mile, which I think was an epic performance and definitely noteworthy. Yeah. That, um, that one shocked the crap out of me because <laughs> I, I hadn't had any alcohol for about seven years before that. And then it was like, oh, I because I've always been pretty dang good at like competitive eating and have a pretty big like stomach capacity and stuff. So I'm like, you know what? I think I can make this work. I'm, I'm just going to I'm going to go do a little bit of research. because I kept seeing all those beer mile national championships and stuff and all of them drank Bud Light Platinum. And I'm like, all right, I'll get that. They know what they're doing. They did the research for me. I'm just going to go to a track. Let's do it. And I ended up running, I think, a 618. And that includes the drinking and the mile. I, my mile splits for 501. So it, it was a little slow. It's probably like 15, 16 seconds per beer to drink um, and, you know, empty it, untwist it and everything like that. But when your heart rate's that high, it's, it's harder than you think. But uh, that, that one definitely shocked me. And I think I'm going for sub six next year. So I'll, I'll run back to that in a bit and we'll compare our, our, our experiences. Mine was not yeah, quite yeah. as good. Um, to, so, but to me, the, the, the other, uh, the other most important fact too is, and I, I know that this is unofficial, but I really believe that you are probably the world record holder for the fastest high rocks completion while having a crap in the middle of it. And uh, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't I think I might have the slowest also because I don't think anybody it, else. It, does, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, you know, if you're the only one in the contest, you still won. I mean, nobody else had the courage to even try it. And you no, came up with no. the idea all on your own. So and it was I also mean... the cleanest bathroom in OCR history. <laughs> let, let me add that because it wasn't a porter potty. It was inside a convention center. So, <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. That's... So, I mean, 
if, if, if we go back a bit, like I said, I just rambled through a few things. We'll go back and I want to yeah. touch on a couple of them because um, the other real thing, the real reason why, why Jackie is so important is because of his stat system. And in my mind, his stat system is so important to the OCR community and to the OCR's future because there's been no way to rate people until he set it in place. And now I know it's, it's just Spartan right now, but I'm hoping and I believe after talking about it, that it is going to carry on to other things. So if we could just for a second, if you could just lay out for some of the people who maybe don't know how your stat system works. Yeah. Um, all right. So, and j just to answer that real quick, I actually do have every Savage Race event ever oh, and Tough Mudder and then Tough Mudder went under. We were planning some big release this year and it oh. didn't happen. Uh, so that, that kind of sucked. And then Savage Race, like they're the other one that has like a consistent schedule. You don't want to do one where it's like OCR Worlds where it's a one-off yeah. type of thing and you just can't really, it's hard to grade at that point, but yeah, so I do have more. It's just 2020 happened. That's all I'm yeah. going to say. Um, right. But yeah, just to, to answer your question on like yeah. how it's set up, just uh, you played NHL, like yep. any of those EA sports games back in the day, Madden, um, everyone has a zero to a hundred rating. And it's pretty easy to know if like a Wayne Gretzky or Yarmir Yager or something back in the day was probably a 97, 98, like right at the top of the league. And then you have your you, probably first line players on the team. Those are going to be anywhere from like an 88 to a 92 and then like mm -hmm. your third line at like non-starters, but still belong in the league. Like there's, they're probably somewhere in like the low eighties. Like you had a pretty good diversity along yep. the team, but you still knew who stood out. Um, so what I did was I, I basically grabbed all the results in Spartan history. We can go into that more in detail later, Oof. but I'll just keep it short now um, on how difficult it was, but I, I got like all the results um spartan history and i was like okay what are some of the most important metrics on how we can actually determine who's better than someone else because prior to that um spartan they just mainly had a uh 300 299 298 they just based everything off of 300 because it was you know representative yeah. of the movie and stuff super easy but it didn't reward you for having like a big margin of victory or you know, having a sprint finish for someone at like it, it or how deep the field was. It did, there was no differentiation between if you won a Sunday sprint on the opposite side of the country as the North American championship that same yeah. weekend with everybody good there. So there was no way to really like weight anything. Um, and Spartan did try that for a little bit, but kind of like what we alluded to earlier, it was beast is worth more than a super worth more than a sprint. It's, it, it's, yeah. it should all depend on who goes there. So I decided to um, come up with a bunch of factors whether it's margin of victory, like how, how close to the winner are you once they cross the finish line? Um, average place matters a little bit, but realistically, if you're fourth versus fifth place and you're separated by a tenth of a second, you're basically the same place. So that, that's not as big of a deal. Um, and a lot of it has to do with who showed up and how do you determine who showed up? It's a lot of what have you done before? Um, granted, you can't just be like, oh, Hobie Call was great or Matt Novakovic was great in 2013 that doesn't mean they're in the current fitness that they're in yeah. in 2020 or 2019 last year and stuff. So um, I kind of needed to figure out a way to blend all those characteristics together to create a, a strength of schedule. Um, you see that all the time in co American college football, where you'll see it um, that like the, the, all the teams in the sec that you have Alabama, Texas, A&M, LSU, like the really big powerhouse schools. Some of those teams might go eight and five, but, they're, they're playing in some of the best bowl games later in the year and you have an undefeated team in a lower conference. And it's like, Oh, a lot of people are like, why aren't they getting, you know, the attention they're undefeated, but it's because they've been facing crap teams and not challenging themselves all year. And I, I kind of found a way to mix all these together and show that, you know, getting 15th at a U.S. national series race might actually be better than winning a regular race, like just based on who showed up there. And um, once I kind of used all the math and stuff that, that I've learned through um, grad school and uh, I'm an engineer. So I've taken like a bunch of statistics classes and I'm pretty good with Excel. So um, once I kind of combined all of those, I was like, all right, now we're just going to go back to how I wanted to put it on that zero to hundred system. Cause they've already proven that that's a really easy way to interpret stuff. Yeah. Um, once I did that, just kind of went year by year and by different regions, I have one for Canada, I have one for the U S and stuff and just kind of took off from there. So, I mean, the first question that jumps to my mind is why, like, why would this, this is a monstrous undertaking. Like you said, I mean, to go through all that data and to log in every Spartan, like even, even if you're just doing Spartan itself to log in all those results from every historic, not only is it, and this is just me guessing, not only is it a problem and, and like 
uh, uh, definitely a labor of love to put it all in there, but to find missing results from something like I've, I've tried to find Spartan results just for myself from maybe 2017 or something like that. So that's bloody hard enough alone. And I'm just looking for me, right. Oh, yeah. to, to go through everybody and to go like, how do you even find that? Crap? Like, how do so, you, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a couple stories. Um, yeah, it, it, super time consuming, but don't think that I'm there just typing Dave finished in, you know, 47 minutes, 18 seconds. He got seven, but like I'm copying this in bunches yeah. and then plopping it into Excel. And then I've got macros running in the background, the calculators that like, I'm not typing this in manually that you yeah, yeah. heard of me if that was, <laughs> but, but yeah. So, so some of the measures I've gone to, like when I, when I first started, um, the reason I, I did it in the first place was because they used to have uh, if you finish top 50 in the U S you would get a season pass for free. It's worth like a thousand bucks. And this yeah, is probably yeah, 20, yes. 2017 um, when they, when they finished and I was somewhere in the low fifties, I was like, you know, 51 to 54, some, somewhere in that range. Yeah. And I just missed out. And I'm like, what? It's like that TMX it. final. Like just, just not quite there. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> Sorry. My life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But no, that, so, so I ended up uh, missing out and I got one free race code. And I'm like, are you oh, kidding me? Free season pass or, or one free race? Come on, that's a huge difference. And I was looking at some of the people who were ahead of me and I'm like, I have never lost to this person. Like my head to head record, I, I faced this guy four times this year. I've never lost to him. And you know, some of these other people, it's like this person only raced on Sunday. Who are they beating? Nobody. Yeah. Like it's, it's not to you know, take away from their athletic performance but it's like if you're gonna reward people for performance you at least want to do it properly that's kind of the way that i saw it and it was more like we should put people in their proper place um if if you're going to give away thousands of dollars and stuff like that um they used to also give away prize money to some of the people at the top who would Mm -hmm. um if you were in like the top 20 you might get a thousand bucks plus your season pass and you know other money um based on what place you are and, uh, so, and a lot of the people towards the top, like in the end of the teens were just those people who were just cherry picking races. I'm like, this yeah. is just ridiculous. So I was like, there's gotta be a way. How good was I actually? So I, I took a few of the names who beat me. I'm not going to name them. Cause it's like, yeah. I, I, it's not like I dislike the people. I, I like, I'm actually totally friendly. name them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, there are a couple of people who, are, who I'm actually pretty friendly with. I'm yeah. Like, no, no, you're, um, you're not better than me. Um, yeah. and, and so I started doing this. I'm like, how can I actually get this on a, uh, on a you know level playing field to actually put some numbers to it. Um, and I looked at specifically results from that year uh, for me and then a few of those people. And then I was like, how did Ryan Atkins do? You know, I picked a couple of really good ones and then just kind of played with them. Um, and I was like, all right, I know how some of these people do because of workouts in the NC camp because uh, mm-hmm. I trained with the NC camp. And like, I'm like, all right, like Glenn Race, for instance, he trains with the NC. He's a few percent faster than me during the workouts. He's five uh, percent faster in, during a race there's got to be like some some way to like measure this so i was just using a bunch of like known data points at that point to try to uh mess with these things and so ended up getting uh all the numbers for the 2017 i think season yeah and guess where i ended up ranking i told you i was about like 50 50 yeah, fi- or 51 to 54 55. somewhere yeah, there. yeah. Where, how, how much do you think i changed as a result of that oh god i hope for your effort at least into the 40s <laughs> nope. I was like almost 70. Oh, <laughs> I actually got worse. So, so all that effort, I actually turned out to be worse than I thought I was. Um, but it, it wasn't that I was. It would have been a good time to scrap the project, man. Yeah, no, no. I know, so you're just, but you know, if your name's Jack, let's add a few points to that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But, but no, what really happened was a lot of people who were below me, actually, once I did the whole season, um, a lot of those people shot up. Like for instance, mm-hmm. Hobie was- Paul won the world title. He only ran two races that year. He was ranked like 1300th or something in whatever series they were doing. And, you know, I, I grade him. He's obviously right towards the top. And so, oh, yeah. so that was really what happened. The, the people who I was trying to justify being ahead, yes, they shot down and, and I went up relative to them, but a bunch of people moved past me. And so I was like, okay, I can do this outside of just the U S because a lot of people in the U S are strictly like, you know, America's the best, nothing else matters. Yeah. And, I'm trying to look at this as a, as a world perspective. I'm like, all right, we had Claude Gabou from Canada, multiple times Spartan race world yeah. champion, Ryan yeah. Atkins. Everyone knows what he does. Lindsay's done the same. Yeah. Uh, John Albin multiple times from Europe. Matt Murphy comes over from Australia, gets second. So I'm like, this is a world sport. There's got to be a better way to um, like just show how, how good people are around the world instead of just like, how are they in America? And cause I didn't want to just do the Canadians who race in America or the yeah. Europeans who come over once a year, they're doing stuff throughout the season and they've got harder travel schedules to get over and stuff. So it was just a bummer when you'd see all these people 
Um, for, for instance, Albert Soleil, he, he started his career with like 16 straight wins, like ne- not even second places, just straight out one. Comes to the U.S., everyone was hyping him up, and he gets like 14th or something. Yeah. And I was like, well, did you have to do a, you know, a 12-hour travel thing, adjust your time zones? Like now your morning is suddenly night, you have to race at elevation. So yeah. I was like, there's got to be a way to you know, balance things out on how they do the rest of the year. How do you do that? You look at what they've done the rest of the year. Um, and then I, I was like, you've got to figure out a way to um, c- just compare countries because how much better is the average U.S. race compared to Europe, compared to Canada, compared mm-hmm. to Asia? Like, for instance, if, if you go to Asia uh, a, a few years ago, you might have been like one of the studs because there just weren't a whole lot of really good people back then. There, I also might have been one of the tall guys and I'm only 5'7". I mean, the things change depending on who's there. That, I, I don't <laughs> quantify that. But if, yeah, 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 if you've got stats on that, then yeah, it might be the case. Um, but, but yeah, so basically I, I, I found out a way to balance those and I was like, all right, well, what about the early days? How good was Hobie Call, like this championship versus first championship? And then like the wheels just started spinning. I'm like, ah, I, I got to keep going back in time. I, I just need to keep measuring this out. So before I knew it, I was dumping a bunch of time into, you know, gathering these results. Like my girlfriend went, hung out at one of her friend's houses and it was crappy weather. I'm like, yeah, whatever. I got a few hours. I'm just going <laughs> to start copying results. And so I went through all the um, Athlinks. Uh, um, you know how that's pretty crappy yeah. website in reality. Yeah, for, it's terrible. Look, it's, it's, it's the worst. And I've like t- trolled them online. I'm like, your results <laughs> suck. Like you can only see eight at a time. Like give us more and half of it selfishly so I can see it. But yeah. if you've ever run a road race, it's, it's way better if you can look at 10, instead of 10 results, then next page. I'd rather just see like a, a hundred names yeah. on a lot, like quick, easy, like name place time pace you know yep. that's it just like simple um but anyway so so i ended up going on something called storage.athlinks instead okay. of athlinks i found this back side of the website that they don't tell you about and they, it, the it dark side of lists, athlinks yeah yeah exactly the 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 hidden part of the website so so anyway they had a um, hundred at a time just like i mentioned like very easy to copy instead of the modern athlinks you know way too overcrowded yep. look well, as I was doing that, um, I probably got 2016 and 15 done and I, was, I kept going back towards 2011. They ended up stop supporting it or they stopped supporting it. <laughs> so it was no longer an option. I'm like, what the hell? No. And so I, I ended up needing to um, try to find another way around this and that you remember CT live chronotrack, how you could go yes. to the results yep. that got discontinued also as that was like my next backup way. And then I, I went on Spartan website and you go to like view old results and you click yeah. load more, load more, load more. Well, the problem with their website is whoever designed it, um, they have basically the load more stops after a hundred races. So if you are more than a hundred races old, it doesn't exist. You go to the middle East, there may have only been 30 or 40 races all time. So they all show up there. Yeah. You go to the U S page or Canada, you're only going to see stuff from 2014 or 2015 because it's still like new enough, but anything before that doesn't exist anymore. And there's no like master, you know, drop down menu where it's here's the 2012 Vermont championship, like click on this, it'll take you to the results. You have to do more Google searching. And so, so there's no, there was no real easy way to uh, find the results. Um, but what I started doing was I, I <laughs> this is kind of ridiculous. So I, I initially, when I, when I got to 2011, I went on Athlinks and I basically just typed in Spartan race and just next page, next page, next page, next page. And I, I'd filtered out by year. And yeah. there were only 11 races there. And I ended up um, thinking I was done, you know, had, had all the numbers. I go to a race the following year and I see somebody walking around the venue with a 2011 t-shirt and it says like Utah and Long Island. I'm like, wait, <laughs> wait, 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 I've never seen those. And so I took a picture of his shirt and there's like 27 races or something. I'm like, what? It's not oh an athlete. God. It's not on here. So I ended up going on, um, have you ever heard of the Wayback Machine? I think I've heard of it, but I'm not. It's basically an internet archive where they take, um, I don't know how they do it, but it's like, all right, here's how the website existed at this date and time. And you can essentially look at like the old school version of a website and stuff. And it's actually pretty hilarious. You go on Spartan Race's website and you you can check like 2010. They're like, are you ready to die? You know, just like all the (laughs) the different marketing stuff that they used to have back then. But Mm -hmm. I found all the race schedules retroactively to that year. And from there, I was like, okay, I need to just, google search or look under the the, another roundabout way of finding stuff and i ended up compiling um i think we're up to like almost 1700 races that have ever happened worldwide um so it's it's a it's an effort i'll i'll look at the 
the men's size. So the men, we've got on my, okay, 357,000 lines of data. Um, oh just like name, result, day of the week, overall, uh, what year it was, what your first name is, what your initials are, um, like what age you are. Like I've got crap ton of stuff, um, <laughs> but it's, it's all kind of allowed me to, cause, cause I always loved sports growing up and sports yeah. statistics. And it's, it's just one of those things that once, what's the snowball started, I'm like, I, I just need to find it out. I, I'm just too, you know, addicted to that. You know, you got to find out more type of research mindset. So. So, I mean, obviously, so you don't run into, and because of the system, like uh, guys like me, you know, real OCR, you know, enthusiasts, honks, addicts, whatever you want to call us, right? You've introduced me to names like Albert Soleil and uh, Miriam yeah. Bosset and, and stuff like that. People that I would never have heard of and yeah. stuff like that. So we, like as a community, I, a lot of whoever that know about it have bought into the system. Like, I mean, it's so much better than anything else that had going. Yeah. Has Spartan bought into the system at all? Like, have they figured out that like, hold on a minute what we're doing is crap and what he's doing is pretty good. Yeah. So I've, I've had multiple calls. Like I've probably had six, seven hours worth of calls with David Watson and Mike mm -hmm. Moore and like some of the higher ups at Spartan. And we, we were in pretty, pretty big discussions last, I'd say like 2019, um, right after the Sparta Greece championship. So like yeah. b right before this, uh, 2020 happened, and it wasn't like they were going to, you know, immediately adopt it and stuff, but they were like, we need to figure out a way to like improve how the U S national series works. And you, you know, they they know that I've got my system down and it, it's definitely more accurate than what they've been doing forever. So we were trying to like figure out ways to keep it simple to, you know, make it pretty similar to what I'm doing, but take out a little a bit of the complexity because you know you're a you're clearly a numbers nerd like you can understand yeah, yeah. this but the average person who's just starting up you don't want them to look at like oh, oh crap this 70 line equation to figure out like, no. what your your score you, you just want like all right here's this times that plus this and then there you go you know just keep it simple um but we, we're you we definitely were having some uh talks about it they're fully aware about it um and we had a couple other conference calls during like the 24 hour um the un unbroken thing that we had like, yeah. as that was going on. We talked about some of the stats and um, it's, it's, it's just uh, bad timing with 2020 there, you know, made, made some pay cuts and that wasn't going to be an option. <laughs> I, I realized very quickly once the year started, but yeah, I, I think eventually it will end up getting, you know, some momentum and stuff and they're aware of it. They're not like, you know, like who is this guy, you know, they're, no, they're, no. they're very, aware of it but nothing's happened uh formally yet unfortunately well and, and i'm sure like i said i mean there's, there's multiple uses for it. one it, it's really cool for me like i mean the first time i i went through it i mean i went to went to the, the anti-camp page and i found myself and i'm like oh neat like there i am you know i yeah. saw my rating it's a little yeah. low if you ask me but it was okay you know i mean it was yeah. bad i'm like maybe a checking line center something like that but <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so it was like good but it, it, exactly so anybody anybody who like has done one of these a spartan you know either competitive or age group race you go in there you can find your rating and it's kind of cool it's you know it, it might be fun like to banter back and forth with your friends or hold a little bragging rights over yeah, whatever yeah. the case may be but it's it's really interesting the other part though and um Spartan did something last, I guess it was 2019 now, where they, they gated the elite field. Yep. And where my first thought of as soon as I heard this was in the application for your stat system is, yes, they gated the elite field. And I love that because I, I don't want to see guys who are fine guys. They're great. They should go to Spartan. They're good people. They should maybe be running age group and open, but they should not be at the back of the elite heat being passed by the women's field who had a 15 minute delayed start in within two miles of the course. Oh yeah. No it, they shouldn't be there. And I'm sorry, you're great people you know race support the sport be involved yeah. in the sport but but race for you to bowl right yep it, it to me it's a, it's a way to gate it the so so they gated that and it's whatever you need a top five or whatever the case may be um i was really happy i, I managed to actually get my elite call yeah. um, by the skin of my teeth probably <laughs> i'm one of those people who really don't deserve it but i made it, <laughs> it happens. um yeah but what i get concerned about is the other direction is the sandbagging. And that's where I thought for a system like yours, and I mean, you, you, you throw out the phrase, um, what was it? Um, I, I don't know, like picking your spots or whatever the case, you know, picking, just picking your chances. Cherry picking. Cherry picking. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know why. Where, where it's like, here's an easy race. I'm going to do that because it'll make me look better. Yeah. And then here's a hard race where all the elites are going in the elite. So I'm going to drop back an age group and get myself a podium. 
right? Yeah. Even though, you know, maybe you would have been a top 20 elite, but you're like, no, I want a podium, I want a trophy, I want whatever the case may be. Yeah. That's where I thought your system could come into play into stopping something like that. Now, is that something that you've entertained or? So, so actually what, some of those conversations that we did have, it was along those lines where basically you go to Athlinks or Chrono Track, whatever you'd sign up for with Spartan. Uh, like if you're, it's like register, sign up for this race and it will basically reference you like you create an account and it will link to my database and it's like what's your score are you a, a 72 sorry you're not going to be able to race this yes yeah. you can you can do age group if you want but it, it kind of puts you in your place and one of the things where you're mentioning with like the uh you know sandbagging and stuff like yeah. that it's if people want to drop down so they could stay age group instead of race elite and stuff you're not going to look as good because your ratings lower and then yeah. that you know that competitive tendency you might want to look better than some of your friends so you're not going to suddenly try to do the minimal best but also keep your score low enough so you don't automatically get booted up there but basically the, the whole thing was what what if i don't know someone who's top 10 like a, a nick Riker or something mm -hmm. like, gets a crap ton of elite podiums but he's he's never podiumed at um the u.s national series for instance but what if he's like, hey, I just want to, you know, just clean house in age group this year. And he's taking mm -hmm. away all these age group trophies from from all the people. He's too good to do that. Yeah. And there are people in age group who are just like him who aren't as good as Nick. But like they're they're too good to be racing age group. Like if you get 20 age group podiums in a year, challenge yourself, like face the best of the best. I mean, I, I probably, I've got five Spartan podiums and like several fourth and fifth place. So I've been like close on a handful of those but I only leave each maybe like one out of every six races with a trophy, but I feel good about knowing like I've, I've faced the best and the best of the sport who were there on race day and stuff. I would actually feel probably bad if I left the venue with an easy podium, for instance, uh, or yeah. if I dropped down to age group, just to, just to make a quick little Instagram post. And I think people can sort of see the difference, but it's one of those things where it, it, I, I just would rather quantify you and make a recommendation on, are you, a little uh, are you better than where you think you are like go challenge yourself more and That's i think i story. you know i think i think the way you put it there is actually fantastic so maybe when it comes to that you don't you know if you if they sign up and they you know the the rating comes in and it's like well i'm going to sign up for age group and if something pops up you know recommended elite you know kind exactly. of thing and it's that would not be like if, a, it's not a forced it would be no. more of a here's where you know you're good enough to do this stop yeah. cheating yourself you know you're good enough you have this many performances that indicate you're good enough Exactly. Exactly. And I mean, like I think of a guy and I mean, with utmost respect and I, I might even be saying his wrong, name wrong, but, uh, uh, Cole DeRosa. Yep. Or, um, yeah. Who's who, I mean, was on the running public and then they, they brought him out and they pretty much introduced him as one of the best age groupers in the world. Mm -hmm. But he, they said, so in the interview, he had 13 elite podiums that yeah. year. That's crazy. That's not an age group. <laughs> you know, I mean, that guy wow. is a legit beast monster. Yes. He's older, but he is a monster of, a, yep. of an athlete and he, you know, in my mind, he would be getting the recommendation run elite. I 100% you know? agree. The only yeah. circumstances that I think it's a little tough on, um, what do you do at a major U.S. national series type style race? Because that's when you, you could see it. You have, you yeah. know, here's your everyday race and then U.S. national series, like the depth of competition just like mm -hmm. skyrockets. And yeah. suddenly it's, you have all the, you might, a normal race might have five to 10 really good elites showing up are pretty good yeah. uh, you're not going to have your Atkins and woods and that level uh showing up but you're going to have like people my quality and stuff showing up to those <clears throat> you go to a national series race suddenly you have 40 of them uh yeah. 50 of them and then you have people who are slightly below you're gonna have another 50 and it's like it's a very deep field um and you don't want an elite heat that's really 200 people deep because then no. eventually some of them are going to get gapped and the top women like nicole Lindsay, all, all them rebecca they're just going to catch up to even the the best of the trail pack of the deserving elite. Yep. So I think in like us national series style races, those major ones that have a, a series designation to them, I think it's totally fine for them to race the yep. age group. And that because of the level of depth within that age group is pretty high there. It's not a cherry picking thing and you deserve mm -hmm. your, your podium. The, the only thing that's really difficult for me is say you're Ryan Woods you're over 40. <laughs> Why don't like, what if he gets fourth in a race? It, I, obviously he wants to win like fourth isn't what he's yeah. going for. And he wouldn't care if he gets a, a, a fourth place or a first place age group thing. Cause he's racing for the best of the best. But I almost think that you should just take like the group as a whole, like, all right, you weren't the first 40 to 44 racer. Sorry. 
you're you're getting you're walking with the second place even though you're the first person in the age group division to finish you were the second person of that age range in the total race to finish so i i think they should almost like vacate some of those uh podiums just, just my opinion for that kind of stuff and, and you're talking maybe going back to actually the old system that they used to have where if you do Ma- like masters plus that no um I, I no no where, where, where i mean possibly along the lines where um so instead of having separate separate gates you have your 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 elite heat essentially you yeah. could have multiple heats and your no I'd, I'd still want one elite heat one elite heat and then still the age groups right okay Re- release the age groups and waves but what i'm saying is at the end of the day combine the times like mix age group and elite and if you you know you're the 20th best elite person you might have been beaten by one or two age groupers let's combine those right there yeah and then go off of ages like if you're 25 to 29, you might not leave the venue with a, with a trophy if you're the top age grouper that day because several people who are good enough decided to race elite within that same age group. It's, yeah. it's not, you know, they shouldn't get the trophy either because they're racing age group, but it, it's just, it gives people a little bit of a self-inflated, you know, I'm, I'm better than I am type of thing. Well, I'm, I'm not trying to like sound harsh, but. No, no, but it's I totally like the if. The if... generation thing bothers me. It's like, you weren't the best. 40 year old that day you have several people like cole uh, or ryan yeah Wood yeah, yeah. who finished ahead so. yeah like if i if i go out there and i and i get a spartan podium right i mean i'm i'm, I'm racing age group i i get a spartan yeah. podium and you're right though like i'm not the best you know 40 to 45 guy because there yeah. was probably a couple of them in the elite field who were faster than me and i mean i, yep. I can think of names like a guy like uh, up here ian saint laurent who yep. um you know races elite and i believe is in my age bracket he might even be older i'm not sure but I don't have a hope of catching him, yeah. you know, and that, even though he might, he might finish top 10, he should be getting the, you know, say, let's just for argument's sake, say 45 to 50. Cause sorry, Ian, I can't remember how old you are, but um, <laughs> well, that's a good thing. If you think he's younger than he is. So. Yeah. Oh, see, he runs like he is. Holy crap. <laughs> so <laughs> if you know, he sh- exactly. And that's why I was kind of actually going back to what I, that's what I meant by going back to the old system yeah. of, you know, you have your, your, elite style wave and then your top podium is your podium and then everybody after that is eligible for the age group but also maintains their position in the elite yeah no you still report the results separately but when you're giving out a trophy yeah it's like were you actually deserving of that That, that's the kind of thing and it's 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 mainly more of the the whole trophy generation mentality that that's what i have the issue with it's like i wouldn't even want to leave the venue with an age group podium like it's yeah. In my opinion, the Olympics don't do that. They're not like you're the fourth no. best, you're a third best person who's between 35 and 39. Who sure it's like you, you weren't one of the top three. That's how it is. But I, I guess that's just kind of my philosophy. And I, I know that a bunch of people who do run age group recognize that. Like they're, I'm sure you and having yeah. friends, you know, conversation with friends, you know where you stand. It's oh, more yeah. like just the the people who go a little over the top on social media. That's where <laughs> I think some of the the people who are in the pro heats and stuff have a little issue with that. And, and, and understandably so, cause you might get like age groupers and, and, yeah. I, and I know you are seeing it now to a certain extent, you're seeing some, some age groupers who are really kind of cashing in on like sponsors and getting stuff like oh, that yeah. because, because they are able to More post eyes. this podium pitch, right? Because they're getting this, you know, the Instagram famous, well, I mean, nobody in OCR is really Instagram famous, but you know, to a certain, to, to our extent. Yeah. And whereas somebody, I mean, I mean, even like yourself, who is, you know, not getting the, the top three at the big events, right? You're yeah. not getting the podium, but I mean, you're destroying these age groupers, but they're going to get the pot, the limelight because they're standing on a box. Yeah. I mean, some people want that. Others, yeah. like, I, I don't really, you know, feel the brand ambassador stuff, but the people who do, like, for, for instance, I'm just looking back at Jacksonville first U.S. National yeah. Series race of the year. So Ryan Atkins, he falls in the 30 to 34 bracket uh a lot of the you know brian gawiski and ian hosick like how do you think the top 30 to 34 age grouper finished like what place overall within that division did the age grouper finish when you combine the elite results? if you if, yeah so if you compared his time to the straight elites i would oh wow if um, you filter out only people who ran that race who were between 30 and 34 regardless uh, of which division and because that's a national series i would think still you would probably have some good age groupers there so i might I'm, i would maybe go with 30 to 34 year old maybe top 25 to, well uh, uh 30 second 30 second so, pretty close to be better the, than i thought <laughs> the, the, the top age grouper uh within that division the like he was 32 years old he finished 12th he was the 12th person in, in the race who was between 30 and 34 to finish. So it's like, should he really leave with a gold plaque? I don't know. Cause he got mm-hmm. beat by 11 other people that age group. They just decided to challenge themselves more in the fast well, heat. 
Exactly, exactly. So yeah. then, so who was who was the first person in that age group? Uh, sorry, that not on the regular podium. So that didn't finish on the podium, but was yep. the first person of that age. Um, thirty to thirty-four, Josh Yamochi. And where did he finish? Um, he finished thirty-second overall. Um, as and he was the top thirty to thirty-four age grouper during that race. Oh no, 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 no. So I mean, so I, I mean, not the guy that raced age group, but a guy like say uh, that was like you said, not not Ak- not Atkins, not oh, you know, not okay. the guy. That, so who is who is the next place guy in that uh, Atkins, age? Atkins, Atkins, Ryan Kempson, Brian Gowiski. So Ke- uh, so so Kempson's would have been the next one off the podium. Kempson, or did he? Kempson no, he hit be, the podium. Kemp, Kempson would have been the true second. With okay, Atkins. and then yep. Gowiski, and then Brian Gowiski, and then Mark Audet. Okay, so uh, so those guys, Hosek, so. those guys were like. Yeah, they're they're like Ian Hosick was the fifth best person, fastest person between thirty and thirty four, and he was twelfth fastest in the race overall and yeah he and he was four and a half minutes faster than the guy who left guy. the yeah it's exactly. nothing again i don't know josh or no i'm sure he's an anybody. awesome dude right you know yeah. <laughs> you know and, and a yeah. great runner i mean even to finish where he did is, is a fantastic you know oh yeah no doubt like i i mean some of the people that he was beating are a pretty solid like like mm-hmm. rich ryan he actually yeah that's wow that's really shocking to me okay <laughs> rich ryan runs like yeah. 15 25k like <sighs> The guy's clearly legit. Uh, it's just the whole trophy thing. That's, yeah. that's what I'm getting at. I, no, and I, I, I'm, I'm in total agreement. I like I like yeah. the, that system. And the reason why I think it'll never happen again yep. is because age group has become such a money maker for Spartan, and everybody likes to sign up for it. Oh yeah, and yeah, I, and I think know. that they're probably some they're more passionate about Spartan than some of the top elites. Oh, like yeah. if you, I, like I know that Cody Moat. Um, He's won multiple world championships, but he doesn't really race a lot. Granted, he's a teacher, so he doesn't get that yeah. time away, and he's got a bunch of kids. But, I mean, you only see him once or twice a year, yeah. and he's multiple-time world champion, yet you yeah. see all these age groupers who are just promoting the crap out of it oh, and yeah. truly are, like, the biggest fans of the sport. So, without question, the sport would not exist without them. It's more of the quantifying. That was with the whole debate yeah. on that. Like I said, I, to- I totally agree with you. I mean, I just I, – and I, I would prefer it the way you're saying, but I – It'll never go back. You know, Pandora, oh, I, 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 Pandora's I box has been open and there's yeah. no close in that sucker. Now, They've now realized one, that. Yeah. What, one thing that I, that I do think, um, you mentioned Colder Rosa earlier. Yeah. If you look at how, um, that, have you ever seen the age group ratings for like track and field and road running? No, so no. Road running bores the hell out of me. <laughs> yeah. That, that, well, I've got a running track back. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, I kind of know about that. But basically like say, say right here, um, you're, 15 16 years old and then you get a little better and then once you reach 18 you kind of stay about the same until you're about 35 and then you start dropping off like one or two percent a year so i think once you're late 30s right around 40 genetics just aren't in your side like you can you could be as good as ryan atkins like getting the most out of your body as he would but you're simply never going to be more than within seven, eight percent of them or something just due to your age like it's just father time's never lost in athletics no so uh, basically at, at that point i think it's 100 percent justifiable for people like 40 plus or so you should do age group like if you're it, you know it, it would be great to see if you can challenge yourself there are freaks like ryan woods and hobie and cody and stuff yeah. but they're few and far between um and i think that it is cool to have those age groups so that you can compare yourself to your like athletes like you know what yeah. what age group are you in uh i'm if well, 45 coming this year i turned 45 okay, so, December, so, so you pr- there you probably you're much more interested in looking like how did I do relative to those people than, yeah. than to the, you know, Jesse Bruce or, you know, Mick Jarello who shows oh, up or I, something like that. I know how I did compared to those guys. Not well. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's not going to be pretty for most people. No, how no. good you are. So, yeah. So you're much more interested in like the, how am I doing? And yeah. you might look the age below you, like how am I against the young forties yeah. versus the late forties? Like, am I yeah. holding up well type of thing? Um, so I think hundred percent, very practical in there. Um, but so yeah, with, without question, they are necessary to have like that. And it, 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 there's a big gap between the able-bodied competitive people. Uh, or, sorry, that's the wrong, wrong <laughs> phrase. More, more like, the, like, do you actually have the ability to rank to race well at an elite level, yeah. or are you putting in the same effort as people who train elite? Because there are a lot of age groupers who put in way more effort in oh. training than some of the elites who are just naturally gifted and just skate by on talent for a while. Um, so, so like, I feel bad for the people who are literally putting in 10, 15 hours a week of training and 
there's just nothing they can do to ever run a sub 17 5k like it's just yeah. never going to happen based on their genetics and you know just the rest of their life like it's just not going to happen so i think that it is important to have classes like that above yeah. open because that the, a lot of the open people are you know they're just showing up because their friends from work found out about it they heard about it one time on a facebook ad or something like that so so it is important to have those groupings but i do think when you're comparing apples to apples you need to look at that combine everyone who's training seriously uh when yeah. you're comparing them yeah i mean yeah absolutely like it's there's never going to be a purpose because perfect system yep. but I, I i definitely think it's still worth the effort yeah. to chase that perfect oh. system to try oh, to make I, it better 100 <laughs> percent agree yeah and, and, and that's why i, mean, I said like I, be, I believe really that your system would truly help spartan with that in the way that they could you know hey make that recommendation i love that recommendation idea that's a fantastic yeah. thing rather than a hard cut rule just a a quick recommendation and, yeah, it could, and it could be different for different levels of races exactly you, you can do series versus non-series you can have like a major where it's going to be a u.s national series or tahoe or something like that and then a minor where it's like a stadium series or a mountain mm -hmm. series and then like you know just a local race you have different criteria like if you're at the u.s national series you better be rated 88 or above to get in the lead and if you're at a mountain series or a stadium you can be like 84 and then like yeah. if you're 80 or above you can do your local one so something like yeah. that. You know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. are you right above 80 just above 80 i'm like 81 nice. yeah, like yeah. 81 just right on the edge like i said i'm right on that edge yeah but um gotcha do you, do you have a certain rival who's kind of Oh uh, yeah, through the years. And I do, and he's like one of my best friends, and uh, and and I'm actually just slightly above him, which is funny because the last time we we raced, um, he beat me. But uh, but how, how much? Because realistically, I, I missed I missed the spear, and he got he got it, and that's why he got me right. So okay, yeah, yeah. But it's but just also on I'm an, saying, on is a, it like an 81 versus an 87, or is it like an 81 versus? Oh no, 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 it's close. It's like it's like an 81 versus like a 79 kind of thing. Like we're yeah, yeah. Because if you're within one or two points, of it, they're very similar like there are people yeah. who are 90s and 91s who have lost to a handful of times and there are 94s that have beaten and yeah. i'm on like a 92 93 so like it, it all depends like some people have their specialty type of course if it's a long beast i'm gonna lose to people who are a couple lower than me but if it's faster i'm gonna you know do better than some of the the people who are higher rated but it's more of what have you done this whole season that yeah. takes yeah. into account so that that's kind of thing you might you might have lost head to head but you're still pretty comparable to each other. oh yeah definitely and and with him and i it's, it becomes he be, we become a, a distance thing if yeah. it's if it's a sprint or, or shorter races or yep. difficult op and, and we go out as spartans right so but if it's a shorter race or difficult obstacles i i end up taking it if it's a longer race more straight running he's he's just got better better wheels than i do and it you know mm -hmm. it is what it is yep. but either way it's made for good fun and good conversation right? yeah. it, it, and, it works and, good and i guess just as, as a hockey comparison because i really did enjoy hockey i know you're canadian like growing up but just it, kissing you know, ass <laughs> no I, I miss it I was, I was so bummed that the uh the bruins got eliminated oh. of stoppage because they were they were the best team in the league going all year yeah. and then you know you start everything you know it, they just didn't have their momentum when when they won the president's trophy and stuff they would have done better but anyway it's like you, you know what Ovechkin and Crosby are yeah. going to give for you day in and day out every year. You know, they're going to score about a hundred, 110 points every single year. Ovechkin's going to get 45 to 55 goals a year. Like, you know what you're going to get. That's yeah. the Atkins and the, the, you know, the Ryan Woods and Killians. They're going to be consistently right at the top. And then you have other players who might have a freak season where they'll score like, you know, 80 points and then 110 the next year and then drop down to seven. It's like, there's a fluctuation. Those, those people have the potential to, pop off a good race in the OCR equivalent, yeah. but they're not super consistent in the long run. So that, that's kind of why you'll see some people it's like, Oh, but they win races all the time. Why are there a few points below me or above me and stuff? So it's more like if you're super consistent, you're going to be towards the top. If you're, you know, a little lower, um, even if you might be a big name, you might not be rated as high as some people. Yeah. All right. So with that, what I want to do right now is uh, I'm going to give you a minute to load up some Canadian stuff and we'll take a yeah. quick break to, uh, for our sponsor to jump in. And uh, yeah, we'll be right back in one second. Do you like destination racing? Are you looking for an endurance event where you can camp under the stars and be surrounded by nature and be with your friends? Perhaps staying in an on-site cozy B&B &B is more your style. Well, look no further. Grip Farm Fitness has it all and more. Located just two hours northeast of Vancouver in the beautiful Fraser Valley. Participate in one of their events or just come out for hiking, horses, or much more. Book any activity your heart desires at 
www.grit-farm.com. That's www.grit-farm.com for our Canadian listeners, eh? It's a good time to grab a beer. If you want. Yeah. Let me just run a mile real quick. Mm. Well, dude, yeah, I'll go through that after too. <laughs> yeah, we got, we got to talk about that. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, sure, if, why not? If, if you want to, um, you know, tell, tell your version of that while this is loading, feel free. Oh, okay, man. So like, I'm uh, I'll record this, but it's still recording. And you know what? Um, they can, they can plug it in if they want. I don't care. they like say they actually do editing. I have no idea how to do that. So, so, um, I did it. And, um, I think I said, I mean, I'm, I'm not at your guys pace, but I can, I can run like a, just, just under a six minute mile. Right. Like that's kind of where I'm at. Um, but I'm, I'm not a great drinker. And, uh, we went out with the same guy who I said is, is a rival of mine, uh, Jeff McCarthy. He came and we all did it together. And we did the first beer. We drank it pretty quick together and we went out and I'm faster over short distance. So I just stayed with him kind of thinking, you know, I'll go with him. We got to that second beer and he just slammed it. And I was there for like ever trying to drink that beer. I ran. I, I, I'm just not a good drinker. I, I don't drink fast. And um, historically throughout my life, even when I was, you know, a young part of your teenager, I was terrible. I just, no, I just can't do it. Yeah. So he, I ran the mile in like, under 630 was was so that's not so that's a bad approaching pretty so, well i mean I, I was like 501 for my mile no, no. and i'm probably like 445 or so shape so you're pretty close to like where you'd be flat kind of like i me. was almost six minutes drinking the beer oh, okay <laughs> so yeah, i'm like i just so it was i mean obviously he just annihilated he actually did all right he was like 820 or, or something like that which yeah you know i mean it's not too bad i mean but yes. uh that's pretty solid. It. Yeah. yeah. Uh, especially if, I don't know, uh, his, his drinking habits and stuff, but yeah, he's, he's play a, a role. He's a way better drinker than me. His, like his mile, I think his, his actually running time was probably like 30 seconds slower than mine, but gotcha. he drank that much faster. That was just <laughs> nice, was, nice, nice. Yeah. My, my fiance did it too. She ended up, she, she earned herself an extra 400 meters. Earned. Yeah. There's <laughs> yeah. no earning in that thing, but yeah. <laughs> and man, wow. that was her fastest 400. When she got rid of that, she was cruising. Really? But that's oh, yeah. solid. Can crack that. So yeah. we're going to dive into some Canadian stats now. And I think what we'll start with, and this is I, like, I'll go with this. Everybody in Canada, we, well, everybody knows CR in Canada. We know Lindsay, Ryan, and Jesse. They've, you know, they're, they're everywhere and they, they're well deserved of their popularity. They're amazing. But not a lot after that is, is known, especially if you talk to people down south. Like, I have a lot of friends down in the OCR community down south. And again, they know those three, but if I ask them to name a fourth, you know, they're done. They're out. Yeah. So who, who are the real, who, who's next? Like who's next on that list of good Canadian athletes? And here's the thing. Are, are they genuinely the top three? I, I was going to say uh, who's next. I would, I would move a couple people <laughs> down. Yeah. There you go. Um, realistically, the best person in OCR that no one talks about is Mick Girello. Guys, <sighs> guys legit. Um, basically automatic podium every single time he's in Canada. Uh, if he races Ryan Atkins, he's less than a minute or so behind him head to head. He came down to the U S he had West Virginia against all the big studs, um, in North America, Mexico, U S Canada, like every single person. And he got, uh, fifth place or fourth, um, two years ago, which is just like, he's beaten every single person except Atkins woods and Killian. That's pretty dang legit. If you ask me, yeah. um, but no one ever talks about him. He's got eight the OCR Worlds. He's won the team competition on there. Um, and like I said, he's pretty much a podium lock for for all things Canada. Uh, and, you know and, who, yeah. So and about Mick, like I, I I've talked to Mick many times, and you know yeah. Mick and I had some good chats. We had um, we have Obstacle Sports Canada up here. We had a virtual race. And Mick Mick yep. won it. Um, well, there was a little complication with that. A little complication, yeah, yeah, yeah. But and, you know, in fairness, that actually just proved what a classy guy Mick was. <laughs> you know, yeah. so. Yeah. But um, great guy. And I think part of the reason that he's overlooked is one, he obviously doesn't travel as much because he is a, he's got a full-time job. Yep. And the, the area of the country he's in being in, in like that Manitoba area. It's flatter than my keyboard. Yeah. It is flatter than your keyboard. And yeah. it's, it's, I mean, I mean, I'm assuming it's very similar to being in the Midwest of, of the States. It's not as densely populated. People don't hear about it. And, there's, I mean, I don't think Manitoba has a single race, like a Spartan race. He has to leave the province so to get a race. I'm, I'm actually going to, I'm going to fast forward on this. So 
he has actually won, uh, or he has three podiums in Manitoba. In, in yeah, but career. now they've moved it. They've moved it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it used it, to have. Uh, yeah, but uh, but I was gonna. Uh, one, one of the things I was gonna talk about later was who's actually podiumed like in every single province. But you, you just kind of <laughs> oh, inadvertently led into that. Right there. We'll do it, man. Go for it. The roll with it. Who, who do you think? Who's, who's in, had the most provinces in which they've podiumed? I would have. Now my first guess would have been either Mick or Austin Azar. Would have been the two that I would would have guessed. Most provinces actually. Austin has only podiumed in Alberta, British Columbia, and Quebec. Josh right, well. Stride has actually done every single one except for Nova Scotia, and that was a one-off race. It's only happened one time. I was so going to say, unless, have they had a Spartan in Nova Scotia? It was like in 2013 or 14. So I, unless they go back there, they, sorry, no. you're, you're not going to get that Nova Scotia. But in terms of like the modern, most so how many? Ones, how many was he has? Oh, how many? What? How many? How many problems he hit? How many? Everyone except? Um, th- there has been a race in Alberta, British Columbia, Manitoba, Nova Scotia, Ontario, and Quebec. So six, and they've done five. Uh, Josh Stride, Mick Jarello, and th- they're the only two who have who have five on wow. the inside. That's crazy. We'll, we'll and touch the lady. We'll do the the women. Yeah, yeah, we'll do the lady. I had, I, I, I'll be honest. I'd never heard of Josh Stride. I, I don't know him. Really? And uh, yeah. Oh, Just thank you. Career podium in time. Canada. Look at that beer. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm getting ready to run a mile after. So okay. What do you think you could do if you like right now? I'm like, hey, Dave, you got to run a mile right now. Do I have to finish the beer or no? Yeah, obviously. <laughs> but, yeah. But I have to you finish have a little the... bit of a sipping advantage with that. Yeah, yeah, there. exactly. Yeah. Without the beer, I think I can. I think I can give you six minutes. With the beer, I'm going to be 25 minutes. I think, give or take. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you know what? That is even probably the wateriest, wussiest beer going. It's like it's it, it's it is. It's like um, well, they call it Sleeman and Clear up here. It's like okay. it's under four percent alcohol. It's like two carbs and 80 calories. It's, it's sewage water. It is. It's water. I'm sorry. I've, I've wrecked my entire reputation as a badass. I'm. Yeah, all good. I, I, I drink terrible beer. Edit this out. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Please, Ryan, save me. Um. Yeah. So that's awesome, though. That, and yeah. I, so Mick, where? So where would you put Mick on this guy? On, on this thing? There would he be? You know. So like, so Mick has actually appeared right around the top ten in the world. Like not not just U.S. Not just mm-hmm. your like worldwide. You're combining everything. Um. And he's up there ahead of the all-time leader in podiums all time, Peter Ziska, who has 103. Wow. Um, he might have a couple more because they just had another race in Europe because they're actually running some in Europe um, but like this month for some reason. But uh, th- yeah, he's he's like top 10 in the world overall um, ahead of Ian Hosick, ahead of, or like they had some actually very, very good battles at the Whistler course last year. Or oh. yeah, 20, I, I forget my years at this point, 2019, a uh, bunch of the U S guys went up to Canada and did that Whistler course, which looked amazing. Oh, yeah. um, but that would, that would definitely be in my Canadian bucket list one, but yeah, Mick overall did, guys, he's so good um, and super underrated. And then you, you already mentioned uh, Austin Azar. Yeah. Very, very underrated. He's had a uh, three separate top 15 finishes at Tahoe, including a ninth place before. Mm-hmm. And no one ever really talks about it. He, he got a hundred miles in world's toughest mutter. Like the, um, he, he might, he might be one of the best at heavy carries I've ever seen. Like oh, he is God. just so powerful. That is, that's an understatement. So we had the Spartan combine yeah. a couple of years ago and I, I'm not exaggerating. We had a one mile bucket. So this is event <gasps> seven or six or seven out of seven. Uh, yeah. The, okay. It was the second last event. We had a one mile bucket carry in sand. It was hot. And then in, it, in sand. It, yeah. It was in Laughlin. In, oh was, my uh, gosh. Out of Las Vegas. Um, and it, literally, as soon as you're done with that, you do rope climb, uh, herc hoist, rigs. It's like it was just to destroy your grip. 20 minutes after that was done, they were like, all right, time for the double sandbag carry. <laughs> and now it's literally the same exact thing with, with two of the weights. And he won both of those by like three minutes. And that's ahead of like Mark Battress, Matt Kempson, like a bunch of the uh, pretty solid racers. Up yeah. The and, and he crushed everyone. The guy's just an animal that carries. Yes, and I mean, again, when we did that thing for Ops Sports Canada, he was yeah, Jesse Bruce had quite a lead on him, and yeah. then they got to this carry at the end, and Austin just just chewed up the gap, just, which is amazing because uh, Jesse Bruce he's done gonna, the heavy carry leg at OCR Worlds before. So, not just before he does it, some of the best of anybody, and, and especially and when on you a consider frame, team, so, yeah. yeah. Like the winning team, he's been the, the heavy carry member on it, and it's like if you're getting chased down by Austin, that just tells you how good he is. At yeah, yeah. Like, like Jesse, Jesse's the guy that I like. You say Noram Worlds. Every time I go there, I see him, and he does. That's his section, and he's yep. 
when you consider frame too, and this is a, a real compliment to Jesse, like Jesse is not a big frame dude. Yeah. Whereas Austin is a yeah, good size, uh, good size like 190 pounds, like yeah. big, big muscly guy. Yeah. 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 I mean, it is, it's just a, de- uh, a compliment to how, well, really how great they both are, but how, yeah. how impressive it is that Jesse at that smaller stature can, can, you know, be so good at the carries. No so, doubt. yeah. So yeah, Austin, Austin and Mick, I, I know definitely, but a lot of people don't know about them and I, I, I've been aware of them. Um, so where does Jesse fit in? I mean, Jesse's got some great range from what I've seen. Yeah. Um, so, so Jesse realistically in Spartan racing specifically, because mm-hmm. if you're, if you're looking at OCR as a whole, he's probably a little more obstacle proficient yeah. than some of the best at um, Spartan specific, like a, a Isaiah Vidal or like a Ryan Kent. They, they've only literally done Spartan their entire career. Yeah. Not to say that they wouldn't do great if they, oh. you know, hopped over into those, but Jesse has explored those, those other series like that. And yeah. that kind of, um, you know, even though he might be a little lower in the Spartan specific ranking, um, he's, he's still, yeah, like a 95 to 96 in that range, which is puts him right around in like the top 25 in the world or so. Um, it, the, the main thing against him is Canada just, you guys have been struggling lately. I don't know what's going on, but <clears throat> I, just the depth in Canada. I don't know if it's the lack of number of people wanting to run the races, if they just, you know, aren't offering prize money anymore, but like, yeah, Canada's yeah. fallen off a cliff the past few years. Well, and I'll, and, and <clears throat> this will be my chance to like kind of educate some people in the South. And this is what has happened up here. So when you do a Spartan race at the States uh, and, and many people who travel from Canada and go down the States, they'll tell you this straight out. It is completely different. It was run completely different. I mean, we, for the longest time here, we did not get any of the new obstacles that Spartan made. So we didn't get wow. Bender. We didn't get, uh, yeah, yeah, we didn't, I think every once in a while we'd get Bender. We didn't get Twister. We, there was no and Twister. Bender's not even Twister. Like, no. It's just a wall that's tilted. Exactly, exactly. Well, I mean, it's, none of Spartan's obstacles are super difficult, so I'm throwing out whatever, you know, um, a panger. <clears throat> excuse me. None of those obstacles. We didn't get any of that. And it just was not run the same. It didn't have the same feeling. It didn't have the same effort level. Um, we were all very hopeful this year because for 2020, uh, Spartan, I guess, HQ had taken over from the franchisee that, you know, I guess for lack of a better word, was, was doing the Canada races. Mm-hmm. So we were, we, and we were promised and we were hopeful that we were going to get a very new feel and a very new race. Uh, sadly, we don't know because, you know, it is 2020. So... We're still, we're still hopeful. We're still optimistic. Um, they reintroduced some good prize money. And I know that had a lot of the guys from the States planning to come back up and compete in the Canadian series, which was going to be great to. Oh yeah. No, do you know who was going to come up? Like I, it, I had heard gonna Woods, Woods was going to come. I know Hosick. Um, like that, you're, you're getting Ian Hosick was going to mm-hmm. do it. Uh, Forrest Bogue that you're going to get some, they're going to be a very, very deep courses. Ah, exactly. And, and so that stuff will go back in 2021. They will be having that same scenario. The only problem that some of us have gotten a little disappointed in is that they have re- they've released pretty much our 2021 schedule and it is still really, really small. And we were hoping for some more races, but yeah, that's, that's probably why the, why, why we haven't got, you know, these up and coming people and up and coming kids is because they haven't, they haven't really had anything to do with that. There hasn't been a reason to do the Spartan race. And right now we have, for example, in Quebec, in Quebec, there's a flourishing OCR community and some incredible local races. And that's what they do. They don't, you know, they'll do the Spartans when they come out there, but there's a lot less concern about it. They're concerned about doing their Northmen, their dead end race there. Um, for example, I was out there this weekend, uh, just got back today from course extreme. The only, I think the only competitive race in Canada this year and, um, you know, uh, again, congrats to Sammy Bear, Samuel He Bear. He won that one. And he's uh, going to be the next guy I mentioned. But yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and when we get to the women, I'll, I'll mention the, the, the female winner was um, uh, Bethany McChesney. She, yep. she took the women's one. So pretty decent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> congrats to both of them. They were awesome. I am. Um, wow. Yeah. Uh, we, we can go through that later. But um, yeah. So yeah, I mean th- that community there has they're well serviced. They have all these races, X Men, everything, and great venues like uh, Al's Head and um, and out, out there like that. They can even, they even go to the Trumbull. They're just they're flourishing, but they have learned to survive without Spartan. So now Spartan has to kind of work their way back and, and give the community some good stuff. Um, in my area, which is the, the the Toronto area, the Southern Ontario area, we don't have a lot, which is strange because we're the most densely populated area in Canada, and we get 
we, we, I don't know why we don't have any of the independent stories. But that's, that's, that's why I think we don't have the up and comings is because there hasn't been enough to turn them on to it. There hasn't been the drive. Like the, we haven't had reason for our athletes who are of the caliber of like a VJ and a young athlete to jump into obstacle course racing because there hasn't been the, the reward for the effort well, I, level. I would say youth is just a, an issue in general, not just in, in Canada. I, I think no matter where you are, it's still in it. It's still, you're never going to really see people under 24, 25 doing it too much. So VJ is the rarity. So I wouldn't say Canada's missing them because they just really aren't too prom or, you know, populated in, yeah. in general. So, so why do you think, actually, I'm just curious to just to completely derail where we're going. Why do you think that? Yeah. Is? Um, realistically. So I, I ran two years in college. A lot of people, it's, it's weird. You, for, for one, OCR is not a cheap sport. If you like, yeah. it's, it's cheap in terms of training where you can just run and, you know, do body weight exercises. But if you're asking a kid who's 19, 20 years old to come and spend 150 bucks for a race and then, you know, 75 bucks for a hotel and then 20 bucks for rental car and then 200 bucks for a flight, it's like, you don't have 500 extra bucks or whatever no. to do that when you're, when you don't have a full-time job, unless your parents are helping you out. And like, I wasn't helped out by my parents or wouldn't have been able to for situations like that. So I think that it, it comes more to the economic side of it until you get a real job, you're not really going to be able to do that. And um, the reason I mentioned college specifically is because a lot of athletes that are good enough, who would do well in OCR, they're recruited by colleges to run for them. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're going to get part of college paid for, because you can run a pretty decent 5k or a mile, you might you probably do really well in OCR if you're, you know, an NCAA level athlete, but would you rather get your tuition paid for and then set yourself up later on? Or would you rather try to be a fringe athlete in a sport that's getting more competitive by the year? That's very difficult to really make a, a huge impact. Like if I came in and I was like some 1435 K guy and I, I looked up and like, Oh, I could, you know, this Ryan Atkins guy, he's only running 1530. I crush him. And then like, you get there, you get your butt whooped. You're like, this isn't for me. I'm going to finish my college running career. Yeah, like, I, yeah. don't, I don't think you can step in and just dominate like you, you may have in the past. So I think it comes down to finances and the, the lore of wanting to be a runner and just the, I don't even know if it's prestige, but a lot of people are running snobs when they're younger Yeah, and then they kind of, <clears throat> they get out of college and they're like, Oh, there's more of athletics than just being a good runner. I, I know like I used to have, teammates would be like well that matt frazier guy and rich Froning, they're not that fit they only run for 19 minute 5k so like, have you ever snatched 300 pounds mm -hmm. no can you yeah. snatch three thirty pounds like come on you're just a skinny runner you, you're not actually that fit overall so yeah i think it's the runner snob mentality also in there that kind of fades away as you get older no, i'll tell you and, and again like, like i said we're off the rails but that's fine i, I don't care um <laughs> there's actually a i'm gonna call it a, a company or a, and they're called rx1 up here and I, I doubt you've ever heard of them because they're they're only in quebec and they just slightly moved into ontario now so they're they've been building up for the past i think eight years and they do essentially almost like a deca fit high rocks type system where but they've been doing it since 2012 or 2011 where they you know it's it's running combined with uh with functional exercise but they also do some, some they'll add their race is not the same every time it changes all the time and they do an entire series over the year so it's a point series over the year they have the whole banquet everything but they've reached out now and are having local schools creating rx1 teams in their schools and then bringing them into races and that to me is how something that ocr needs to do and i think to mm -hmm. to grow the sport somebody one of the bigger places like Spartan needs to go down into that grassroots level and start building from a school, like get into those schools and say, Hey, build yourself a Spartan team. Here's some discounts. If you bring a school team to the race, Yeah, you know, hundred percent agree. And like, I, I know when I was a little kid, I would make my own obstacle courses at the playground. Like yeah. I was doing OCR when I was younger, like timing with those simple stopwatches with my brothers and neighborhood kids and stuff. And I was doing that forever. And then you just, you don't have that option. It's like yeah. time to run track, trying to do baseball, time to do some other organized team sport. And I feel like this is the first generation where I think you have a lot of parents who might be, you know, 40 or so and have kids late elementary school, early middle school, where the kids don't want to be the next football or basketball star. They want to be an American Ninja Warrior. They want to be, you know, an OCR athlete. That didn't exist beforehand. So I think it's still going to be a few years until you see people skip the the college route and go straight into OCR or, you know, they're good enough to compete in college. They might 
compete during the the year and then hopefully don't get caught for NCAA violation <laughs> you know, prize money later on. But I, I do yeah. think that you will see some talented people do the VJ move, uh, bypass college altogether and try to make an impact on the sport, but it's not going to be for in, in a larger scale for another five plus years, in my opinion, just based on the, the ages of the kids who are influenced at this point. And, and you're absolutely right about that generation because uh, my son is now 17 and he came to me when he was 13 years old and he didn't, he didn't want to, play in the NHL, which is good because he's terrible at hockey. Yeah. But he came to me and he said, he goes, I want to be an American Ninja Warrior. I didn't have the heart to tell him that actually to go on the show, you need to be American. You can't as a Canadian, but I'm like, dude, Ooh, dude, geez. let's do it. And he's yeah. grabbed onto it and he competes and he competes and he does really well. And it's been amazing for him. And that's what I'm saying. You're spot on about that generation. You're getting the first kids and you see it on the show who are coming on that are 19 and 21. And I will tell you right now, there's kids that are 16 and 17 that are going to oh, yeah. blow those guys out of the water. I, it, the, the way that I see it, no matter how deep the field gets, your John Albins, your Killians, your yeah. Atkins, they're, they're going to be best of the best. Like Johnny yeah. Lima, you're not going to have any better descender than Johnny Lima. No. Like he literally outdescended Joe Gray, who's the best mountain runner in North America for a decade by like over a minute. The guy is world-class on, on that level. But what's going to happen is – that gap between like the A and B is going to get so tight that all the, you know, the, the B pack like me, it's, we're just going to get, you know, meshed in with each other. It's going to be hard to be tell, or it's going to be hard to tell a difference between all those, you know, the, the trail pack people, cause it's going to get so much tighter and you're going to have so many more people like that. Um, give it about five years or so. And it's really going to get interesting. And I hope you made your impact now, if you're <laughs> one, of, one of this level, cause it's, it's going to get harder and harder to do. But that, as far as the sport is going, though, is going to create more stars because that kind of um, even playing field where you're going to be, it's not going to be the same people all the time, right? You might going to get a lot of fluctuation, even if it's just in your top 10, if, if it, top 10, if Ryan and, and John are still winning everything, yeah. but then your top, you know, three to 10 is moving, jumping. Good. People will pick favorites. People will get on board. Sponsors yeah. will pick favorites and get on board. And that's where it it's, could it's be. It's going to make those prediction contests I've had even more difficult. Yeah, I've done really bad at those. Do you want to know who uh, <laughs> who did one of the best in the entire world last time? Oh, yeah, uh, or yeah. for I think it was for Jacksonville. We had about 400 people. My girlfriend, who knows nothing about OCR, doesn't run anything like that. She finished like 25th in the world, nice. and I was I was like 90th. Matt Davis was like 70th, and we were smack talking each other. Both you know did really bad in in terms of that. And then uh, like Audrey's like, oh, how did I do? I'm like, uh, uh, I don't know. I'm gonna tell you, uh, yeah. She's like, oh, I just you know I I thought that that girl Lindsay had a, a nice name and my sister's yeah. name is Natalie. So I picked Natalie Miano and I know that Ryan's are good. So I picked all the Ryan's and I'm like, oh, Jesus, what am I? I sound like such an idiot and you're just picking names that you like and you do better than us. But yeah, well, that, that just goes, that just goes to show that, you know, the, the more people with the potential to, to be in that top, like teens to top five or, you know, between five and 15 or so, it just makes it even more difficult. Like as the talent pool increases. Oh, absolutely. And, but I, I do believe that that kind of will also be good for the sport though. It, it'll be great. I think. Yeah. Run away with more good. Yeah. Like, and, uh, go ahead. I, I was going to say the first ever uh, Spartan race world championship in Texas in 2011, the overall winner for the women was from the open heat. That's not going to happen anymore. Like, it, 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 <laughs> no, that, but it's cool that it did. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's not cool if you're hurt cause you didn't win no. $10,000, but, uh, they should give that but yeah, it, it just goes like the, the depth, especially like between genders women are moving up um mm -hmm. but realistically there's still about three times as many good men as there mm -hmm. are good women and like w within each group like if you have a an average race in canada you might only have 10 or 15 total women doing the elite heat like it's it's pretty ridiculous how how much it's dwindled um mm -hmm. and that doesn't tell you anything about the quality of the athletes now the ones who are at the top they're going to be great whether they're racing in europe or the u.s or anywhere but that next pack it just isn't as strong as it would be in the u.s for instance so it, okay. it's just give it a few years and the women will be where the men are today and the men are just going to keep advancing but i still think that gender gap is just based on how it's been for the, the decade of the sport the women's depth is it's it t or it trails by a few years roughly and actually that was a conversation i recently recently had with bethany mcchesney is is how do how do we encourage more women who maybe are of caliber that they can run with 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 her and the other women to to take a shot to get in there like maybe some of these women in age group are you know they're not going to win but they could 
make a good showing? How do we encourage yeah. them to get into it? And that's where to circle all the way back a system like you, we were talking about that where they sign up and Hey, you know, you're good enough. You're good enough. It recommended you to go. Yeah. yeah you know, I, yeah. she signed some girls signing up for age group and it says recommend elite. I mean, that might be all it takes to give them the mm-hmm. shot in the arm to, Hey, you know what? I am good enough. I can give it a try and go for it. Cause yeah. if you don't think you're good enough, you're, you're not going to perform like you are. So basically if you get that confidence heading into it where they believe you're good enough based on whatever metrics are out there, like the, they wouldn't even need to know it's me who did it. It, it, would, yeah. it would at least give them more confidence to be like, you know what? Okay. I'm going to take this a little more serious. And once you know, you're actually good enough, that just builds on itself. You might have friends or training partners that you convince to do. It. And before you know it, it snowballs and you have more good people in the sport. And I mean, to, to build on that too, like, uh, this was advice that actually Mick Torello gave me. Cause I mean, I, as you know, like I said, I'm right on that edge and he's like, you know what, you, you give it a shot. He goes, yeah, you're not, you're, you're not going to win. He goes, but you're going to run the best race you've ever run yeah. because you're out there with better competition than you've ever been with. And you're going to bust your ass to do yep. as well as you can. So but- yeah. Best 5k that I ever ran. I got like 20th or 30th in the race and mm-hmm. it was like 20 seconds faster than any other 5k <laughs> I ever ran. And what happened was just a bunch of like these recent graduate college people showed up at the first road race of the summer and they were still super fit from their outdoor season. And I'm just like, I'm just going to hang on as best I can. I died. Yeah. Like I, I ran yeah. a really bad third mile, just faded and stuff. But because that competition was there, it, pushed me to my best ever finish relative to normal in a 5k and same thing happens like i'll have races where i'll finish 10th or 15th or not probably not 15 but like you know right around 10 and i'm like oh i'm used to getting like right right in that three to five range and i'm more happy with my performance in that race where i finished yeah. worst place wise because i was able to hang on the back of like bracken or the kempsons and stuff like that longer than i thought i normally would be able to like i I think getting the most out of yourself is a much better performance indicator when the good competition shows up, like Absolutely. Than just getting a good place. And that's what I qualified for, for pro OCRWC this year for the first time ever. And nice. it could, could be the last time, but that was the same thing. And, and that's where Mick gave me the advice. He's like, go out of the gate and he goes, just keep them in sight. Keep them in sight as yep. long as you possibly can. You Stay with contact, them as it's long. Over. That's right. But he goes, by the time they pull away from you and they will, he goes, you're going to be so far through that 3k race that you just gut it out and finish it. And yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's the plan. So we'll 100%, see. hundred percent agree. Yeah. That you're, you're not going to run your best as a negative split in OCR, which is really good <laughs> running. That's how you do You like, you never want to blow up in a marathon and hope to do well. Like it doesn't work that way, but no, no. in OCR, you just got to go for it from the gun. And it's, it's, it's a very difficult mentality to do, but I think that it pays off if you want the best performance. All right. So to go back to where we were before yeah, oh, we yeah. went off on a huge tangent, Sam, Sammy Bear, you were Sammy Bear, Samuel E. Bear. Yep. The guy, the guy is basically Mr. I win every single team championship mm-hmm. at a major race type of thing. Have you noticed that? Mm-hmm. Like he's oh, yeah. always, always winning in those at OCR worlds. I, he probably has more, uh, more podiums than pretty much anybody in the sport simply due to how well he's done at those. Um, mm-hmm. And, and the guy, like he finished right around top 20 at uh, Spartan race world championship. He's, built pretty similar to Austin, like a pretty big guy. Um, is, yeah. we, ha- we had a really good battle at City Field. He did the New York Stadium last year. Um, he, he beat me by like seven, eight seconds. And I was like, that was one of those races where I was like, holy crap, it's Sam like a, or Samuel A. Bear. And I almost, you know, beat the guy. But yeah, he's, <laughs> like, he, he's a monster at pretty much every, super well-rounded. Doesn't matter if it's short or long and just unbelievable obstacle proficiency, um, great grip strength and stuff. And but yeah, like you've got so many good guys. Uh, Sean Stevens Whale, another guy yep. that never gets any attention. He got top ten at the Red Bull World Four Hundred World Championship, oh, which is just awesome. that that crazy steep. I've done a couple in Colorado when they've had him, but like that guy, he he's finished I think roughly top twenty at Tahoe a couple times. Like unbelievable climber. Yes, he's got interest in other sports and stuff, but if you have a mountain course he's going to keep up with some of the best. I think he was top 10 at Tahoe after like the first hour or so. And then maybe the cold got to him or something. But I remember seeing his name right at the top of the leaderboard for like an hour last year. And it's like, that's some good climbing and ability. And you've got obviously your um, Jesse Bruce that we talked about, Mick Durello. Um, but that, there are a couple other guys, um, that Jeff Krar. Uh, I've seen his name <laughs> pop up a couple times okay. and he he's been right around Mick. I'm pretty sure he's just a really good trail runner. Um, but I, like, he's a name that you never really think of, but I've got him rated uh, over a 94 guys Ooh. clearly legit. 
uh, Chris Swanson. Do you know him? Yeah, I do know. I knew of Chris Swanson. So he, he finished, um, he was one place ahead of me at the Tough Mudder World, the 10 mile world championship. Mm-hmm. That guy can run like that. He just, he stuck with the, uh, the main pack and then faded a little bit, probably going out a little too fast, but like he was holding 550, 540 miles for several miles with the obstacles included in there, uh, trying to stick with like the woods and hunters and stuff. Like, guys got some wheels. Um, and then I, I never know how to say his last name, but Christian Wiklawick, or do you know who I'm talking oh, about? Oh, yeah, 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 well, yeah. I know who you're talking about. Um, he's yeah, well did the obstacle sports candidate. He's a beast. He, yeah. He I'm was running actually with him. Austin as well. Yep, he, he's also rated 94 plus also. Yeah. So and he like should guys, be, he's really good. Yeah, yeah. And doesn't, doesn't he have a brother like Steven or Stefan? Or I don't know his brother. I know, I just don't okay. know. But. Yeah, but but like the, the best of the best within Canada would hold their own anywhere. But the issue is that next pack, you don't have as many good people in that like the, the, the yeah. stereotypical race between like the five and 20 range. Like you, yeah. the gap just gets watered down a whole lot. And that that's the main issue that's happened in Canada. During the early years, do you know Ben Moore and Boucher? Yes. You know, I don't, I don't know him personally. I know of okay. him. I definitely know his exploits. He, even though, so he, he's, he's a legend had, in Quebec. Yeah. He, he's had uh, four races total since 2017 in Spartan. Yeah. That's it. In the past four years, 2017 through 20, I know 20 didn't really happen. He did did he win all four? <laughs> no, he didn't win them all, but he, yeah. has, he, he is one off of the all time record for the most podiums in Canada history. He's really? Like 29. And it's like, he hasn't, he's barely raced in the past four years. That's how much of a, you know, a, a, a big mountain he's built up in the early years. He's got 29. Jesse Bruce is the all-time leader with 30. Um, and then yeah, Josh That Stryd one's going to keep growing. Yeah. Josh Stride yeah. has uh, 28, McDrella 27, and then Austin uh, has 21. So you've got, you know, your, your usual suspects. And I guess Sam Bear is the next one. Yeah. But the, the guy that no one ever uh, remembers in the early years, Marco Bedard. Like he's doing the oh, yeah. race. Yeah, because he's he, had, yeah. He's had like top 10 Tahoe finishes. He's won the Ultra Beast for that. Uh, top top 10 Killington finish. He's an animal. Like, well, and, just, and you go back to, to, you know, Battle Frog days. Oh, yeah. On the and, pro team. There were a couple times you got, you know, the, I, I, he might have been racing too much. Um, never Didn't really recover enough on some yeah. of the, the grip strength thing. But regardless, yeah, it, when he was on, he was consistently rated like 96 plus, which it doesn't matter. You plop him anywhere in the world. He's going to be a podium threat in almost any race. Um, so yeah, Marco Bedard, a, a name forgotten, but pretty. Well, and pretty again, like with, with like, like Claude, like you mentioned before with the, oh, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's <laughs> multiple time world champion. I, I would be willing to bet two thirds of current OCR fans. Doesn't matter when you started, whether yeah. you're a new fan or, you know, been there for a while. I would bet two thirds of them don't even know who she is. Oh, I think you're probably right. Which is and, sad, maybe mm-hmm. even higher. And it's like two time world champion, but everybody, you know, might know who the the, the person f- f- flaunting all their uh, age group podiums on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about Claude. She's pretty dang good. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Let, let's do a couple more uh, Canadian stats. Who do you right. think has run the most races in Canadian history? Just period. Uh, this is age group plus elite. Age group plus elite run the most. Oh man. Um, I'm mean, trying to think of someone who would travel a lot and. Um, yeah, I mean, let me throw it out there. Maybe I'll go with age group and elite. Maybe I'll, I'll, you know, I'll just throw it out, and then I can throw the name out. Everyone is uh, yeah. J- John Loney, who's uh, uh, many, many no. age group stuff. Nope, nope. Um, but it's it's some guy Matthew Tarango. Matthew Tarango. Yeah, he has he has fifty five races in um in Canada, uh, and that's a lot because we get like four a year. <laughs> yeah, se- second is yeah, second is Josh Stride with forty eight. Yeah, Ryan Dawson. Do you know who that is? Yeah, I do know the Ryan Dawson. Okay, yeah. He's got forty four. So, uh, so yeah, you've got uh, several. You know, obviously that Matthew guy has run the most, but yeah, I was I was kind of surprised that there have been that many races through the years um, in Canada. But still, um, do, do you know that in so the first ever Spartan race was in Vermont in May two thousand and ten. That was okay. the first. It wasn't at Killington. It was in um, Willing or Williston. It was just a, a town somewhere in Vermont. The second race ever was actually a sprint in Montreal uh, uh, that July. So a couple months later. Really, and that was so, 2010. So, so, yep, in 2010. And then you guys also had uh, 2011. You had a sprint in Vancouver, Montreal, Toronto, Ottawa, and Calgary. So you had five races in 2011. So like, 
you guys have had races throughout but, the years. Yeah. Well, um, what's happened is we've lost some, right? Because I, I they didn't get the tournaments, and right now, yeah, we're pretty much down to um, uh, Red Deer, Alberta, mm-hmm. um, Ottawa, Montreal, and Toronto. Did and, Kimberly come back? Yeah, I, I don't think so. I think it's that, Mick told me that that was the hardest race he's ever done in his life. Yeah, I don't. I don't that, think so. You didn't do it. Okay, it was. It was basically like it, like three thousand meters of ascent in a beast, something stupid yeah. like that. And it's like that's not. It, it took over three hours for a beast, which they, doesn't happen anymore in modern Spartan. They even so, they even changed this year. Um, most people kept going on about Owl's Head and how difficult Owl's Head was. Yeah, and um, and I know people who have done Killington and can compare Owl's Head to Killington and say like it's it's close, but. Yeah they've switched off that venue too. I'm not sure why. I mean, there's so many issues why you can switch venue. And a lot of that is business that uh, obviously we don't get too much to hear yeah. about, but yeah, no, you know. it's, it's a bummer. I, I wish that you guys definitely had more races because the people who are, you know, the, the best racers up there hold their own. It's just, you need to, you need to get the population. That's the, the main until, thing. until just recently when Spartan finally canceled all the races for 2020, because we, we were, they were holding on until I would say, Three weeks ago, I was going to say was really, it, was some, yeah. it was after Fourth of July. You guys still yeah. had stuff planned. Oh, it was it was into August. It, yeah. it was like so we still had planned, and that ultra that was going to happen at Collingwood at Blue Mountain, yep, was going it's to be course, and, and and it would have been unbelievable because everybody was like, "I'm in, I'm in." Every elite you talked to was going to come, no matter really? where they were, as long as they could get there, they were going to get there. I mean, like I said, Mick, Austin, uh, I know Atkins, Jesse everybody Dang. was going to come and do it because it was the only thing that was going to happen. And then when it finally shut down, it was like, Oh man, I was, the nice thing for me is that's only about 45 minutes from where I live. Perfect. And I was going to be, Oh, wait a minute. Wait, I've got, I've got something for you. Yeah, right go so for I it. went to OCR worlds 2016. Yeah. All right. I, so I was stupid enough to not get a data plan with the, and neither were my friends. <laughs> so, so basically we were doing the pinch and zoom method. Like, yep. right, I think we went past here. How many gray road somethings are there? On the <laughs> Holy crap. Like, I, I and if it's not gray, it's Bruce. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's the other one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I just remember driving by like, you know, gray road 17 gray road. And it was just like, they're not in order either. Like no, based on what I was saying, no it wasn't like, you know, just a uh, grid, grid space, but, every single time we're like oh we just passed gray road 50 and they're like we're, we're, we gotta go back and it took us like four hours to get from the airport to where we needed to but i was just like that's was, good because it should only take about an hour and 30 I, an I was, hour and yeah, it's like less than 90 miles and it took us yeah, way yeah. too long so yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> if, if anybody gets really really complicated in that i just tell them if you're trying to figure it out get on highway 10 and go north until you hit water and then make a left and you'll find some people might drive through the water based on gps these days but, <laughs> yeah 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 that's true yeah. and it's a big thing of water too <laughs> yeah 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 kind of got some but, lakes but yeah. yeah um but yeah just a couple, couple more guy stats for you yeah so throw them in. you guys ha- you, you just mentioned the ultra beast and everyone's going to be doing that yes. um in canada so you guys have never had a stadium race in canada no um, it's but you've had sprint super beast and ultra beast yeah do you know which men have podiumed at all of those distances um at, with, within canada so all of them within canada and obviously not obviously minus the stadium series so yep. or not again, stadium, just a stadium yeah period. stadium race stadium race because yep. and by the way we have a fantastic stadium that we could use for that that's open all winter long which one uh roger center sky dome oh, convertible yeah. roof i That'd mean cool. there's, it doesn't do anything in the winter yeah it does concerts and stuff right there's no there. there's no yep. team that plays in there in the winter time it's and true. it's big enough you could hold the whole thing inside yeah no i i i and the i would say honestly like baseball see i don't like fenway park for the red Sox, but mm. roger center just looks bigger like in in general i mean you 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 can definitely get some serious uh, elevation gain in that stadium oh yeah yeah like it's it's the thing about it too is and people around here complain about it so much they're like oh we need a new one we need a new one i'm like that thing's amazing it still works perfectly you know that it it actually has the functioning roof that works every time they use it that's hard that's hard to go yeah Yeah, so i don't know anyway um so to to guess oh man so you need somebody with that can, can cover a wide range um yeah, I'm, I'm going to play the easy card. And I, I don't think it's Ryan because um, I think he doesn't race in Canada enough. So yeah, he's, he does not have the ultra beast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, so. he's six for six. He's won every single race he's done in Canada, though. Yeah, yeah. I'm not surprised Which is on that. surprising that he's only done six races in Canada in his life. It is a, a bit. But I mean, he spent so much time with Battlefrog. Yeah. And then yeah, the, and they just they just weren't paying out. I mean, he 
let, let's face it, like Ryan Ward goes where the money is, which and that's his I'll job, play. right? If you're good enough. No, no, it's, it's not a knock. It's, it's smart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he goes where the money is and the money was not here to yeah. be had. Anytime there was a race here that paid, he went to it. He's doing it. Yep. Yeah. And, yeah, he, you know, he he's... actually, the, the only race that he ever ran for Spartan before that second place in 2014 Killington was a, a local race in Canada um, yeah. and th- that he ended up winning. And it, it was kind of hilarious because I, I um, was just looking up videos for a different thing that we were trying to do, like the best OCR venue bracket. Um, but I found a, a video of that venue and it was like the first recorded interview of Ryan Atkins, like that had ever, it was before World's Toughest Mud and stuff <laughs> like that, that he won that. And it was just pretty hilarious. Like, oh yeah, it's pretty, pretty good course, you know, just, just what, like same exact same, yeah, same yeah. years ago. And it's just like, ne- the guy never changed. And Ryan like, could have been a hockey player because he gave the same hockey player interviews. Like the, oh, yeah. they don't, they don't really tell you anything. They're yeah. very polite and nice and cordial and like they say everything, yeah, everything they're yeah. supposed to say, yeah. but they don't give you any extra information. Yeah. Did, so, are there any like outspoken athletes that you know of in OCR? In, in Canadian, yeah, like, in, in OCR? Canada? In Canada? Yeah. No, no. There's barely yeah. outspoken people in Canada. We, we all <laughs> Do you know any outspoken Canadians, period? Don Cherry, that's it. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty But, good. um, yeah. you know, and it, the crazy part is there is, uh, if you get them alone, there's some Canadian racers who have some fantastic opinions who are so freaking smart and, you know, mm-hmm. will blow you away with what they say, but you're not going to get them to say it in the public. Not, not in public. Yeah. Not in public. They're, They're just too nice. Back. They're too nice. Yeah. Um, and so I'll start out. I would guess Jesse Bruce for the one who's, yep. who's won everything. He has multiple at every distance. Yeah. Yeah. And that, it, it's because he's got such great range. Yeah. You know, no and yep. that would be, yeah, yeah. I, 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 the only other one I th- could have thought of would be a guy like Austin who has done a hundred miles yep. at world's toughest Austin, modern. Obviously Austin also, has... um, Marco Bedard, Adam Lister, who yeah. has, he won the Tahoe ultra beast championship a couple of years ago. Do you, do you remember that? Uh, yeah, I believe. Yeah. yeah. It, it was like the, the world championship one for that. Yep. Um, and then yeah, that, uh, Mick Durello also got an ultra beast mm-hmm. once. So. I think Mick Drill, Mick, Mick said his first race in Spartan was a beast or something like that. Like he really? Right in, yeah, yeah. I, I was, did an interview with him once and he, he went right into a beast and he said he had no idea. Yeah, how, that's unfortunate. Were you wearing the, uh, the sneakers and, and everything? Yeah, he, he, he podiumed. He actually podiumed it. Yeah. So, no, so that was... Uh, I'm actually pulling up uh, Mick's stats right now. Just, just to, Oh, yeah, try to, to find to, his first one. rattle right? off like how impressive the guy has been. Yeah, li- literally. Yeah, he won the sun peaks ultra beast back in 2015 yeah. um but yeah his career finishes in canada um okay i'll, I'll filter it outside of the u.s but he literally three three one 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 two one 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 two one two one like 15th at tahoe first time ever like racing in the u.s besides a, a stadium series race um and yeah, the, the guys like automatic ones and twos every single time. Guy, guy's an animal. So basically, Absolutely. automatic win or second place. Oh yeah, in Canada. Yeah. So. so put your money on a podium anyway. <laughs> yeah, so true. But all right. But yeah, so those, I those think are some of the uh, those are some of the guy stats. I know obviously not as as detailed overall, but um, there there is one really cool one that uh, do you, do you know John Schmidt. John Schmidt. John Schmidt. I think I actually do. Yeah. Okay, he, he's a Canadian racer. And basically, wh- one of the things uh, when Yancey and I started doing this, we were like, let's just make like something that's going to be almost impossible to um, to just like guess who actually holds these things. Okay. And there are only a hand, there are like three or four people worldwide who have finished first, second, third, all the way down to 15th, like an in individual place at some point in their career. Okay. So that shows that they can be like utterly dominant and win a race. Um, if probably there's a little less competition, but mm-hmm. also when the good guys show up, they might be a little less consistent. But uh, one of one of the uh, three people worldwide who's ever done that is John, <laughs> John Schmidt. Canada. So pretty, nice. Pretty so he's been right first there. all the way down to 15th. Yeah, so that that's some pretty crazy range. He was the first person to do it, and I just remember that. And I was like, "That's that's pretty badass." Like having that range. I think I'm missing, uh, like I've never won a Spartan, um, so I'm missing that. And let's see the other one that I'm missing. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm missing a win, thirteenth and fourteenth. So I've got twelve out of the top fifteen. So 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 you haven't got a win now. I would think that you're. Here's the thing: if you start, if they start decade, does that count? Would that, would that count as a win? I mean, no, it's, gonna I, I it's, gonna no? Be, it's gonna be exclusive. But why have I not like? I, I'm just asking this out loud. Why have I not used this to my advantage to try to get like an easy win at some point? Like, because yeah. I know which courses are the easiest. 
There you All go. you have to do is get on a plane and go to Hawaii, and that's the cheapest or the <laughs> easiest, but it's not. Provided a, provided a hurricane doesn't cancel the race. Yeah, this is true. Yeah. I, I know a few people who got stuck out there on that one. Yeah, yeah. Did, um, did, did you see that on Discord where some people were like asking me for help to try to get their first age group podium and get, <laughs> get their easy uh, elite ones? So, so what I'm going to try to do is uh, release some stats like here are the easiest races to do well at. So hopefully if races happen in 2021, people will be able to fill they, their calendar and finally get leave the venue with the trophy. They're going to become the most competitive sea level race ever. It'll be like, because everyone's going to be going there. Yeah, it's everyone. like a total, total trolling. And then like, I go to the one that's the opposite and yeah, <laughs> that way, so, yeah. exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, I think, I think we're going to wrap it up for today. And then sure. what we'll do is we'll come back and we'll do one with the women and we'll go through a few other things. Cause I definitely want to talk to you about some of the other stuff. Like, like deck of fate, like your experience with stuff like that. And yeah, uh, definitely. And definitely compare TMX experiences. I love talking TMX. I yep. wish it would come back. I've even uh, tried to convince Yancey that he should make a deck of X, but I don't think I'm getting anywhere. Well, they have a deck of strong that has no I saw running. That. I yes, saw that and, and I like that. that next weekend. All right. So, so Nick Riker, the current record holder, if you're uh-huh. listening to this, I hope you have approximately uh, oh. 160 hours left as the record holder. Shit just got real. <laughs> oh, no, we've, we've been going back and forth that guy yancey he's great he, he, so nick is a ridiculously good athlete um, he is super like he doesn't he have no idea what he's doing with like weightlifting but he's just grinds and like muscles his way through it uh he's like that was the ugliest fastest time in something i've ever seen in my life and that's what yancey messaged me uh, about how nick's form was and stuff but still set the record but so, he got but, it done right it, i mean that cardio engine counts for so much right oh no doubt yeah the guy's an animal even um, when you're doing 15 minutes of, of workouts it's still cardio yep well, I'm, I'm predicting that next week, by the time, if, if this episode goes out in the next week, uh, next Sunday, the 19th, I'll, I'll be the new record holder for that. Granted, All right. um, Ryan Kent will not be there, so that helps. <laughs> All right. So thank you to Jack Bauer, new DecaFit, strong world record holder in the future. Hopefully. Um, or I'm hopefully yeah, yeah. You can edit this out, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. All right, man. Thanks so much. Awesome. And uh, we'll catch up again and we'll go into the women and all the other stuff. Sounds good. Thanks, Dave. Take care, everyone. Thank you for listening to the BeastNet Canadian Edition podcast. Please click on subscribe, like us, and feel free to share the podcast with others. Give us a review on iTunes or Spotify. We'd also love to hear from you on who or what type of content you'd love to hear on the show on upcoming episodes. The BeastNet Canadian Edition podcast is proudly brought to you by Grit Farm Fitness. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or at beastnetpod.com. That's beastnetpod.com.